chapter eight. It was September when Abel, when Abel evolved another scheme for getting home. He would catapult himself across the stream with his clothes stuffed full of grass for a cushioned landing, using a small stump as a winch, he tried with a rope to bend a sapling down to the ground so he could fling himself over the water. But he managed to bend it only two and a half tails. That was all the wood yielded to his strength. So this scheme, too, miscarried. A few days later, he succeeded in making a fire. He had learned about the primitive methods in school, but he had never tried for himself. After a series of failures, he finally found the right kind of stick to twirl and the right piece of dry wood and the right kind of tinder to flare with the first flame. His fires were as magical to him as they had been to his prehistoric ancestors. Here's a picture of him making fire right here. He first used his fires for smoke beacons to attract the attention of some civilized being who might just possibly be among the trees on the far shores. When he had a fire burning, he would partially cover it with damp leaves so that it would send up a thick white smoke. He learned to roast his seeds by placing them on rocks close to the fire. Later, he was able to cook various vegetables flavored with wild garlic or onions in pots made of a reddish clay from the lower end of the island. The clay he baked hard in prolonged, intense firing. The man has built a fire. The man, the mouse, has built a fire. He is learning to cook. He is building his own clay pots and making things now. This mouse is a changed mouse. He's very different. He's learning a lot. He also made paper thin bowls of this clay and from time to time he would float one down the river with a note in it and a flower or a sprig of grass sticking out to attract notice. Here's a picture of his message in his little um, clay boat that he would send uh, messages down the river trying to summon people that he needs help. Here, one of his notes. Whoever finds this, please forward it to my wife, Amanda de Chirico Flint, 89 Bank Street, Mossville. Dearest angel, I am alive. I am alone on an island, marooned somewhere above where this note will be found, God willing. There is a tall cherry birch tree on the northern end of the island, and the island is about 12 tails long, 12,000 tails long, and is below a waterfall. Do not worry, but send help. My utmost and entire love, Abel. Whoever finds this, please send help too. I will be able to give a substantial reward. That was his note that he left in that bowl. Sometimes Abel would climb to the top of his birch tree or some other tree and wave his white shirt up and down and back and forth for many minutes, hoping that someone would make a miraculous appearance, return his signal, come to the rescue. There was no point in yelling because the river was too noisy for his halloos to carry. During the equin equ equinoctial rains, he spent the whole of a dismal day indoors, listening to the unceasing downpour on the inside of his log watching it through his door and through portholes he had made. The infinite pall of falling rain, the sagging wet vegetation, the drops dripping from everything as if counting themselves, the runnels and pools, the misty distances, and the feeling of an ancient melancholy. So he's got days where it just rains and rains and rains because it is fall now and that's what's happening. Rain caused one to reflect on the shadowed, more poignant parts of life, the inescapable sorrows, the speechless longings, the disappointments, the regrets, the cold miseries. 
It also allowed one the leisure to ponder questions unasked in the bustle of brighter days. And if one were snug under a sound roof, as Abel was, one felt somehow mothered, though mothers were nowhere around and absolved of responsibilities. Abel had to cherish his dry log. At night, when it cleared up, he went out in the wet grass and watched a young moon vanishing behind clouds and reappearing over and over, like a swimmer out on the sea. So here is him going outside at night after the rain cleared up, the moon is out, and he's just kind of looking up at it. Then he went inside the log, barred the entrance, and laid down with Amanda's scarf. Drugged from the aroma of rotting wood, he lost consciousness and slept. There was a din of crickets outside and the pauseless roar of the river, and the stately world was illumined with pearly moonlight, but inside the log it was dark and hushed like a crypt. The castaway dreamed all night of Amanda. They were together again in his dream, in their home. But their home was not 89 Bank Street in Mossville in his dream. It was a garden, something like the island, and full of flowers. What was marvelous about this otherwise ordinary dream was that Abel knew that he was dreaming, and he was certain that his wife was dreaming the very same dream at the very same time, so that they were as close to each other as they'd ever been in the solid world. And that's apparently both of them dreaming of each other at the same time. And that is the end of chapter eight. So I am going to stop there and I will continue on another time with the next chapter or two. I hope you're enjoying it.